Tonight I'm reading from The Christian Archetype, a Jungian commentary on the life of Christ by Edward F. Edinger. And tonight I'm going to read the last chapter, chapter 14, which is Assumption and Coronation of Mary. This is the image which goes together with the beginning of this chapter, which is from Coronation of the Virgin, chapter 14, Assumption and Coronation of Mary. The young quote, the dogmatization of the Assumptio Mariae points to the heroes Gamos in the Pleroma, and this in turn implies the future birth of the divine child who, in accordance with the divine trend towards incarnation, will choose as his birthplace the empirical man. The metaphysical process is known to the psychology of the unconscious as the individuation process. That quote was from Psychology and Religion, Collected Works 11, paragraph 755. The assumption of Mary lies outside the incarnation cycle and, perhaps for that reason, has no scriptural basis. It is a product of legend and spontaneous collective belief. Quote, for many centuries celebrated as a church festival, the assumption was in 1950 declared an article of faith by Pius XII. There is no scriptural foundation for the belief which rests on the apocryphal literature of the third and fourth centuries and the tradition of the Catholic Church. It forms the continuation of the narrative of the death of the Virgin. The 13th century, a period when the cult of the Virgin was ardently fostered, saw the appearance of the Golden Legend, a popular source book for artists in which the apocryphal story was retold. As the apostles were sitting by the Virgin's tomb on the third day, Christ appeared to them with St. Michael, who brought with him the Virgin's soul. And anon, the soul came again to the body of Mary and issued gloriously out of the tomb, and thus was received in the heavenly chamber. And great company of angels were with her. The assumption was first widely represented in 13th century Gothic sculpture, especially in the portals of churches dedicated to the Virgin, and was to remain an important devotional theme in religious art. And this is where the image comes in. The coronation in its most usual form shows the Virgin seated beside Christ, who is in the act of placing a crown on her head. She may alternatively be kneeling before him, or she may be crowned by God the Father, as in figure 29. For our purposes, the Assumption of Mary can be considered as the comprehensive summarizing image that expresses the fruit of the incarnation cycle taken as a whole, namely the conjunctio. In the same decade that Jung was announcing the empirical discovery of the conjunctio archetype, the Pope announced the dogmatization of the Assumption of Mary, 1950, which event Jung considers to be the most important religious event since the Reformation. Answer to Job, paragraph 752. This remarkable piece of historic synchronicity underscores the fact that the conjunctio is the relevant symbol for modern man. Quote, the nuptial union in the thalamus, bridal chamber, signifies the hero's gamos, and this in turn is the first step toward incarnation, toward the birth of the Savior, who, since antiquity, was thought of as the filius solus at lunae, the filius sapientiae, and the equivalent of Christ. When, therefore, a longing for the exaltation of the Mother of God passes through the people, this tendency, if thought to its logical conclusion, means the desire for the birth of a Savior, a peacemaker, 
a mediator pacem facens inter inimicos, a mediator making peace between enemies. Although he is already born in the Pleroma, his birth in time can only be accomplished when it is perceived, recognized, and declared by man. Elsewhere, Jung points out that the assumption of Mary transforms the trinity of Christian dogma into a quaternity, thus making a dogmatic reality of those medieval representations of the quaternity which are constructed on the following pattern. Holy Ghost, Dove, above Mary, Christ, sitting on the right hand of God the Father. The assumption of Mary was prominent in alchemical symbolism, which anticipated the relevance of this image for the modern mind. The symbolism is expressed in condensed form in a picture from Reusner's Pandora, 1588, figure 30. The picture is titled, quote, a mirror image of the Holy Trinity, unquote. It represents the coronation of Mary, who takes her place with the Holy Trinity. This event in heaven is mirrored on earth by a strange image representing the extraction of the spirit Mercurius from the prima materia. The four corners are occupied by the symbols of the four evangelists, the typical figures which constitute the Christian quaternity. In the lower portion of the picture is a lump of matter, out of which a monstrous creature is being pulled by a crowned and haloed figure. The monster has a haloed human head, human legs, snakes for arms, and wings on the body of a fish. About this picture, Jung writes, quote, The taking up of the body had long been emphasized as a historical and material event, and the alchemists could therefore make use of the representations of the assumption in describing the glorification of matter in the opus. The illustration of this process in Reisner's Pandora shows underneath the coronation scene a kind of shield between the emblems of Matthew and Luke, on which is depicted the extraction of Mercurius from the prima materia. The extracted spirit appears in monstrous form. The head is surrounded by a halo and reminds us of the traditional head of Christ, but the arms are snakes and the lower half of the body resembles a stylized fish's tail. This is without doubt the anima mundi who has been freed from the shackles of matter, the Phileas macrocosmi or Mercurius anthropos who, because of his double nature, is not only spiritual and physical, but unites in himself the morally highest and the lowest. The illustration in Pandora points to the great secret, which the alchemists dimly felt was implicit in the assumption. The proverbial darkness of sublunary matter has always been associated with the prince of this world, the devil. He is the metaphysical figure who is excluded from the Trinity, but who, as the counterpart of Christ, is the sine qua non of the drama of redemption. His equivalent in alchemy is the dark side of Mercurius duplex and the act of sulfur. He also conceals himself in the poisonous dragon, the preliminary thonic form of the lupus etherius. Unquote. In heaven, the Trinity is being transformed into a quaternity by the addition of Mary, who represents the principle of materiality. On earth, crude matter is being transformed by the extraction, bringing to consciousness of the autonomous spirit hidden within it. Earth and egohood have gained a place in heaven, and simultaneously matter is found to have a spiritual dimension. The extraction process begins with a lump of crude matter. This can be understood as signifying all the problematic realities of incarnated existence. Quote, and this quote is from William Shakespeare's Hamlet, 
Act Three, Scene One. The slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to, the whips and scorns of time, the oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of disprized love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes to grunt and sweat under a weary life. Unquote. Out of the lump, a bizarre creature is being pulled by a crowned and haloed man. This man can be considered as the Christified ego, that is, the ego operating under the aegis of the self. In heaven, the principle of materiality is being glorified. On earth, the task of realizing that glorification is taking place through the redemption and transformation of concrete personal existence by means of the individuating ego, that is, an ego that is carrying the process of continuing incarnation. It is shocking that the anima mundi, who has been freed from the shackles of matter, should be a monstrosity. This alludes to the fact that the living experience of the self is an aberration a joining of opposites that appalls the ego and exposes it to anguish, demoralization, and violation of all reasonable considerations. And yet the same event viewed from above is a coronation, demonstrating once again the reciprocal and compensatory relation between the ego and the unconscious. The goal of the incarnation cycle, like the goal of individuation, is the conjunctio. The time has come for the psychic opposites, heaven and earth, male and female, spirit and nature, good and evil, which have long been torn asunder in the Western psyche to be reconciled. And so this completes the reading of the Christian archetype, a Jungian commentary on the life of Christ by Edward F. Edinger. I hope you've enjoyed this reading. In the near future, I'll be reading The Bible and the Psyche, Individuation Symbolism in the Old Testament, also by Edward F. Edinger. Thank you for joining me. We will be discussing the last two chapters of The Christian Archetype on Monday evening, November the 11th, 2019, at 8 p.m., U.S. Eastern Time. Thank you for joining me tonight. Please note that if you're living outside of the United States, we turned our clocks back to U.S. Standard Time last weekend. So our time zone is Eastern Standard Time. Please check your clocks if you're outside the United States. Thank you and good night.